Welcome uh, to this evening's Silkus Journey Book Talk with authors Heather Morris and Lois Lowry. We're delighted to have them both with us virtually. Uh, I would say this evening, although it's morning in Australia, Australia. So we're delighted to have them with us virtually this week on both days that are happening right now. Uh, I'm Ari Goldstein, Senior Public Programs Producer at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. We are New York's Holocaust Museum, and we've had the great pleasure of working with both Heather and Laura, uh, Lois on past occasions, including a terrific event with Heather last year for her first book, The Tattooist of Auschwitz. Many of you watching may have read The Tattooist of Auschwitz. Uh, the novel has sold millions of copies around the world. It was the number one New York Times bestseller and number one international bestseller in 2018, and it really has been a, a deeply important contribution to the field of, of Holocaust literature. Uh, Heather's second book, Silka's Journey, is what we're going to focus on tonight, released in 2019. Uh, and we're excited to dive into it. And I should mention that she has a third book coming out, released in the United States next year in 2021. Heather is in conversation with Lois Lowry, who has also made indelible contributions to the field of Holocaust literature. Lois is the author of several books for children and young adults, including The Giver Quartet and Number the Stars, both of which won Newbery medals in the 1990s. Throughout this evening's program, please feel free to submit questions and comments for the panelists in the Zoom chat, and we'll have a Q&A period during the last 15 minutes of the program. Uh, all of our work is supported by donors and community members like you, so we thank you for your support uh, and ask you to make an, consider making an end of year gift to the museum if you have not done so yet. Public programming at the Museum of Jewish Heritage is made possible in addition to viewers like you by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, by the New York State Council on the Arts with the support of Governor Andrew M. Cuomo and the New York State Legislature, by a Humanities New York CARES grant with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Federal CARES Act and other generous donors. Without further ado, I'll hand things off to Lois. Thank you again for being with us this evening. Okay, thank you, Ari. Bye-bye. I hope you're hanging out there in the background. So if we need you, we can call on you. But hi, Heather. Uh, we've met before uh, by video, of course, and uh, it's summer where Heather is, and it, there's a foot on the of snow on the ground where I am. But nice to see you, nice to be with you, and nice to be with, I'm, I'm watching the numbers at the moment, 260 participants, 61 as we speak. 62. I'm not going to keep doing that because it would drive us all crazy. But out of those hundreds of people who have joined us tonight because they're interested in what Heather has to say, there may be one or two or three or five of them who have not read the first book. So I'm going to ask you just for background, even though we want to focus on, on the more recent book, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about the tattooist of Auschwitz. And, and as a writer myself, this is kind of an odd question and just came into my mind. I'm curious how you and the publisher decided on that particular title. Uh, I assume the title came after the book was written, but maybe I assume that because that's what happens to me. Uh, but I'm aware also that it's a very um, engaging title. Uh, it's, it's a title that when a person walks into a bookstore and sees that title, they're going to pick up that book. I'm not sure why, except that Auschwitz is part of our history uh, that still grips us all, or should. And tattooist is kind of a, a bizarre term. Maybe now that most of us who have reached my age have grandchildren who have tattoos and we wish they didn't. Uh, but at any rate, uh, so I'm, I'm just curious how the title came to be. Was it after the book was written? Clearly it was, it permeated the material in the book, but could you just talk a little bit about him, his title, the book's title and how that came together? Oh, look, thank you, Lois, and yes, delighted to. Um, I, I think can I just make the comment that I suspect that Auschwitz, that word, it actually resonates in the DNA of all Jewish people. Uh, it's not a word that just you've never heard of and you, you don't know what it means. You know what it means, it's in your DNA. 
In terms of um, writing Lali's story and calling the book The Tattooist of Auschwitz, no, it had that title many years ago when I originally wrote his story as a screenplay. To me, there was no other title to give it. Spending three years with this man who, well, he called himself the Tetevera. He never used that word tattooist to him. He was and the Tetevera. Is that the German word that means tattooist? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. And that he was referred to at all times. But of course, we anglicized it for, for the book in English. Um, good to see that in Germany, when they published it, they actually used the word Tetevera. Mm -hmm. uh, and can you, can you go back now, because you mentioned the man himself. Can you go back to how you were introduced? And first of all, would you tell me how you pronounce his name? L-A-L-E -L -E is the way it's spelled in the book. And uh, I just want to be certain we're pronouncing it correctly. Yes, he's, his name is Lully. Lully. Him, uh, oh. His real name is Ludwig. Uh, yes. You can call him Lou. Every woman called him Lully. Lully was a pet name his sister gave him. Okay. And, and how did he first acquire you as his? Uh, or how did you connect with him? Who brought him to you? How did this meeting come about? Yeah, look, um, this is a good lesson, folks. And never say no unless you really have to to anything that uh, comes into your life or... or that you're asked to do, because I finally agreed to meet a friend for a cup of coffee who I hadn't caught up for several months. And she just casually said to me, oh, by the way, I have a friend whose mother has just died. His father has asked him to find someone he can tell a story to. That person can't be Jewish. You're not Jewish, do you want to meet him? I said, well, what's his story? And she said, I don't know. So for a second time, I said yes to meet him. She knew you were a storyteller. Well, no, not really. I worked in a hospital in the social work department, but she knew that I had been going to a few courses learning how to write screenplays. Okay. I did want to learn how to write screenplays. I thought I'd write the, the next big blockbuster. Never happened, did it? <laughs> it may still. And so she introduced him to you and you to him. And your, your idea, his, his motive was to tell his story. And you were the recipient of that, but you intended, and, and I guess did write a screenplay of his story. Is well, that um, correct? I did eventually. Now, his motive, the first day I met him, you've got to picture an 87 year old man, so grief stricken that he actually didn't want to be with me. Well, he didn't, he didn't. He wanted to be with Gita. He wanted to be with the love of his life who had died all these years. And by the way, it is absolutely appropriate that I talk about him and his story when talking about the Hawker story, because the two are just you know, uh, intrinsically entwined, there mm. would be no Hawker story without Lully telling me about it. Yes. And there would be no Lully if it hadn't been for Sulka saving his life back in Birkenau. So, um, you know, for many months, this man, he was telling me his story factually and clinically because, well, he didn't know me. How, he, he wanted to tell me his story but of course, until he got to that point where he felt he could totally trust me. And that came about when I took him home and introduced him to my husband and young adult children. And he got to know who I was as my kids, God bless them, shared with him all my faults and foibles and all my sort of yeah, everything that they could come up with, which they thought was negative, he should know about their mother. It which sounds as if you, your family became his family. Absolutely. Um, we were just uh, connected so beautifully. It was wonderful. And you know, he used to flirt with my then 18 year old daughter. He was, um, he was quite the charmer. But that's how I absolutely would characterize him. This charming and cheeky, really, really cheeky. And what was your reaction at that time to hearing the story that he was about to and then proceeded to tell you, which is such an astounding story. Now, initially, he was, as I said, he was telling me things quite factually. There was none of the emotion of uh, actually remembering what it was like to be there. That, that, that came, that happened, came. But um, in my hearing to it, it, I then went away and did my own research. And that's when I got shocked, Lois. That's when I got punched in the guts. Because what I was researching and finding out uh, told me that he was actually downplaying the evil and the horror he was not giving me the full impact of what it had been like for him 
and that made it just incredibly hard for me to now sit and look at this beautiful you know, elderly man knowing that it's, it's you've, you've downplayed this and so I confronted him about that and that's when he did start breaking down yeah you know, telling me from the emotional perspective what it was like you know I could physically see him he would go back to 1942 to 43 the eyes would just glaze over and he'd look beyond my shoulder and he was back in that place. Mm. That's when I got the story, the, the deep emotional story. And when you say back in that place, where I went back in my mind, having just read the book quite recently, was the way you decided to begin with him 25 years old in what, 1943 perhaps? In, in the uh, railroad car. Uh, it's always hard to know where to begin a story, where to enter a person's narrative. Uh, but that was a place where he was on a journey uh, to he didn't know where. And, and uh, you, you take us right in there into that cramped, horrible, filthy, smelly railroad car with him and, and begin that, that terrible story. And yet the story that has the, the thread of a love story within it. Uh, so can, can you take us to when he met her for the first time? Look, I think that thread actually is a great big solid piece of rope, isn't it? Um, it absolutely is uh, to me or to Lali, that was the story he wanted told. Yeah, that's the challenge, isn't it, as a writer, where to begin and where to end. Mm. And of course, um, I decided to just confine it to that period of April 42 to January 45, for the most part, and just sum up at the end. Uh, otherwise, you'd have a book the size of War and Peace. Um, or you'd <laughs> and that, that wouldn't do, because I, I wanted the story to be read and to be just focused on that, that fine time. You know, he was on the first transport of young Jewish men to go to Auschwitz. And About he had volunteered for, he didn't know what he was volunteering for. No, but I, correct, do I remember correctly that he volunteered in order to protect others in his family? Well, that was how it was faced. Just prior to the boys being taken from Slovakia, the girls, the young girls were the very first Jewish people taken to Auschwitz from Slovakia. Uh, there's some incredible stories and I'm actually even right now writing another one about the young girls. I'm talking about 15, 16, 17 year old girls. Uh, so yes, it was April 42 and well, so the word was that one member of a family, one child should go and work for the Germans. That's what they thought they were doing. They'd be back soon, go and work for the Germans. Mm. But if that's what it took to keep his family safe, then of course he was going to do it. No question. And so he found himself in Auschwitz. And then came the time when he met the woman who would be the love of his life under those terrible circumstances. So can you describe that meeting? Here's the thing, because it's not in the book. And this is why I love talking to, to you and to people who've read the book, um, that what I haven't told you is that he was a self-confessed playboy. He had this incredible life in Bratislava, uh, the fine job, the fine clothes, and lots and lots of girlfriends, he told me. And a different girl for every, every day of the week, he sometimes would joke with me. And that's how he saw himself as this man about town. But um, that just made it all the more incredible for me that he could then sit with me 60 plus years later and tell me about the girl who stood in front of him with her head shaven, dressed in rags and unbathed, look into her eyes and say, I knew in that second I would never love another. And she was only 16, am I correct about that? Yes. She was, she was a very young girl. She was, and um, yeah, he, he said she had black eyes. They were in fact just very, very dark brown, but- uh, You wow. never met her though. She had died before you met him. Yes, and that's the reason why he told his story, because Gita had uh, refused to talk about it. It was a subject for her that only the two of them ever spoke about, he said, in our own bedroom, you know, never to their son. Or well, Lali did, but his mother, um, Gita, she never spoke about it. She wouldn't. To her, the past was behind her. She needed to live in the present. So she wouldn't let him 
talk about it. So it was her, her dying that um, he said, no, I, I want somebody, find me someone. So it's a long and a story that encompasses several years and, and it's filled with drama and suspense and tragedy and lots of different characters. And you had to whittle it down and decide how best to tell it. And I'm sure you've experienced what I have uh, because I've written several, a few books that are fictionalized history that, that are true events, but written as fiction. And of course, my audience is usually young people and maybe they do this more than an adult audience, but they always ask, is th was this true? Was this true? And it's sometimes as the writer, it's, it's hard to sort out where truth edges into fiction, if, particularly if, if you combine them well, which you have done. But do you find people still asking you, did this happen? Was this person real? And, and to what degree did you combine real characters and create one out of several? Oh, the composite of characters only really, uh, I, I played about with, with regard to the, the sheer number of the, the prisoners. Now, the Nazis who I refer to, they are real characters those significant people that were in his life who were the Nazis, ESS, Beretsky and Schwarzhuber and Kramer and Hess, they are real. There is no composite of those characters at all. Uh, there is no composite of the character that the, the Roma and Gypsy woman who was part of his life, who he connected with. Um, Gita, of course, is in Silka, no composite there at all. The character Dana, who in fact was Silka's, I mean, Gita's closest friend, well, she's actually still alive. She's 97, her name is Lottie and she lives in Sydney. And um, we just changed her name. Um, I, I've known her, well, Lottie introduced me to her, and, but um, we, she agreed that I would change her name. So those significant characters, they are not composites. They are very real characters. And um, you can read about them in other stories, of course. In terms of what I created in Lottie's story, here's the thing, Lois. I only created one event in that entire book that did not come from Lully's memory. The one thing that I took creative license with, and it relates to a scene where the, the allies flew over Birkenau and the prisoners were all running out saying, drop the bombs, drop the bombs. And when the plane just flew away after it circled about two or three times, uh, and then the Germans just opened fire on all the people who had, who had raced out. Now, I put Lully and Gita together when that happened. In reality, they weren't. Uh -huh. That is the only thing that I've created out of all of Lully's story. And he, though he's, he uh, hasn't lived, but been alive to read the book, he read many, many drafts of the screenplay that I wrote. And this is his story, his memory, not the story of the Holocaust, a Holocaust story. How difficult was it to adapt a screenplay which you had written and turn it into a novel. I've, I've done the reverse. I've, I've adapted a novel that I wrote to the stage, not to film, but I've not done it in the reverse as you did. Um, look, when you've never written anything before and you don't know what you're doing, it's, it's actually not that difficult. You just take the screenplay, put that in front of you there and then go start typing. And I've actually had, um, I don't know if it's a criticism, but I've had comments made to me that, you know, in parts, your book still reads like a screenplay, because I use a lot of dialogue. That's interesting. I guess that means that it's very visual, for one thing. And, and certainly it was. I could see those events happening as you portray them. One thing I wondered about reading it was it encompasses several years in the same place in Auschwitz. And there are long periods of time, I'm sure, there where the same things happen over and over again. Uh, and so I'm sure it was a task for you or a challenge for you to to portray the passage of time, the spring, and then it's hot summer, and then it's winter, uh, but to keep it moving along without dragging, as, as even horrible though the events were, it must have, time must have dragged for those people. Look, you are absolutely accurate when you said that um, things that were happening there were being repeated week, yes. month after month after month. 
Uh, now, you've probably got about 30 to 35 percent in the book of what Lully's told me. Because, you know, he lived those three years or nearly three years there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in particular, his association with Mengele. Um, I did not want to make the book about Mengele, so I had to put him in there. But so many of the things that uh, Lully saw and witnessed that evil, evil person did, mm. there was no value in me continually putting that in. It's in once, I think probably twice, that's enough. Mm -hmm. It was a finding those different um, experiences and horrible things that he was witnessing and just having them in there once. It's like it's almost like I'm giving you a taste of what his life was like without mm -hmm. giving the whole meal. Um, at the at the very end of the book because we 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 need i we, we need to go on to the second book <laughs> and so i want to stay in the first one where where we're introduced to silka but i want to mention one other thing at the end of the first book when he does reunite with gita the woman girl he has loved in the camp and now auschwitz has been liberated he's free He's back in Czechoslovakia, is it? Or Slovakia? At any rate, it struck me that it, this has to be true because if she made it up, an editor would say, ah, this strains credibility here. Uh, he's, he's walking down a street, or actually he's in a cart of some sort, and there she is. He's been looking and looking for her, and then on a day when he's not actively looking for her, he happens on her. And I assume that's the way it really went. Life is <laughs> stranger than fiction. And here's the thing too, Lois. I have got two versions of it. I have Lully's version, which she told me, and which is how it's played out. But Gita made a show a tape. And on there, I, because I've seen it, I got to see and hear Gita saying how she was walking down the street in Bratislava with two of her friends. And one of them said, look at that funny little horse and cart with a man on it. And in her own <laughs> words, yeah. I recognized him and I stepped out in front of the horse. And uh, in her tape, she adds, that was the only time in my husband's life that he was speechless. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, now I'm thinking it should be in the movie because that's a perfect movie scene. And, and let me ask you if, if there are plans afoot to make a film or a TV uh, series or whatever, and are you allowed to talk about that? Because sometimes those things are kind of hush hush for a while. Uh, look, the fact that it's being uh, made into a six part mini series is no longer hush hush. Okay. Uh, um, only last week, I, and actually this week, I, I met with one of the producers who just happens to live in Melbourne, but they're all in the UK, the, the makers are in the UK, and I've had uh, Zoom meetings with uh, them in the last two or three weeks as they now would try and get to that um, a development, of, it's in development, the production phase, and uh -huh. how to safely, uh, film it, so yeah, a six-part miniseries. So we don't yet know when it will be completed. They're just no. The um, the aim now because I've got to create that. The aim is, of course, to shoot it in, in Poland or Hungary. Both those countries have uh, offered the facilities, but both of them are no are not COVID uh, safe at the moment. Well, of course, yeah, everything is held up. All the film industry right now are trying to find ways to to film COVID safe, and whether yeah. that means yeah. your cast and crew and isolating. So, but it is well along the uh, development phase, yes. Good, good. Okay, let's jump back into the first book briefly now though, to introduce the audience uh, to Silka, who will be the main character uh, mm. around whom the, the second book focuses. And so she saves his life, essentially. Mm. And, and uh, he, it was he who told you about her, obviously. But can you just tell the audience tonight briefly what role she played, and yes. how and how difficult it was her situation was, uh, and and here I don't want to interrupt you or keep you from talking, but I just want to say one thing. I always view a book as a as a vehicle by which someone can enter another character and empathize with them, and and follow the decisions they make and think as they're reading, subconsciously perhaps, 
what would I decide? What would I do in these circumstances? And certainly Silke is the one with whom a reader can uh, have that, that whole set of feelings. What, what would I do if I were in her circumstances? So now can you talk about her a bit? She was young and beautiful. Yes, and um, firstly, Phyllis, no, I'm not writing the screenplay. Three professional screenwriters are writing the screenplays for the miniseries. And uh, Carol, yes, there is, uh, there is a, um, a US broadcaster that will be um, showing it to you. So stay tuned. But, um, you know, I wrote Silke's story for two reasons. The first was that Lully said to me so many times, when you finish telling my story and then wag his finger only after you've told mine, you must write about Silka. You must tell the world about the bravest person. Ned wag his finger again and go, not the bravest girl, the bravest person I ever knew. And many times when he was really just stressed, he would say to me, you know, you and I are only here because of Silka and she saved my life. And there was very clear to me that talking about her was an incredibly emotional thing for him, more so than even talking about uh, how Gita was surviving in the camp. And uh, it came about that that was because, whether it was a, a sense of guilt, but he was overwhelmed and overburdened with the fact that there was nothing he or anybody could do to save Silka being further imprisoned after she was liberated um, by the Russians that and what happened to her and he knew what happened to her by the way because Agita kept in touch with Silka once she'd uh, uh, got back to Slovakia and she'd visited her and stayed with her mm -hmm. so she knew a lot now here's the thing guys she was a 16 year old girl just turned 16 in the March and in April she's in Auschwitz look she's this beautiful petite little thing and uh, there is no other way to describe how she survived in Auschwitz other than being the sex slave there of the, the main commandant in Birkenau in particular. And I do not shy away in my story in telling her story of the abuse, the sexual abuse that was perpetrated on her and others. It's got me into a little bit of uh, yeah, conflict and bother, but um, I've done the, the research, my publishers have done the research, we know that not talking about what girls and women were, uh, well, subjected to and endured in terms of sexual abuse has not been something that has been written much about in the Holocaust. Um, the reasons seem to be that it doesn't quite fit into the narrative of the, the, the six million Jewish people who died, that it, that is to be the story that, that travels. And um, yeah, maybe I am rocking the boat by saying, but hang on, there is this other storyline and to ignore it. Uh, and, and when we hit, we're told, well, it's not written about because we don't want to shame the woman who it was subjected to it. Well, I'm afraid I actually get quite angry at that because um, I don't see it as shaming them. I think it's our shame yes. that we have allowed them to live for decades with this secret. And it's now, by the way, coming out in, in um, nursing homes all around the world. Yes. This 90 plus year old woman who lose that filter now to, to uh, talk about it. And so, then yeah. this yeah. child, this by the end uh, of the war, she's what, 18? Yes, yeah, she, um, she would have just turned 19 when she 19. found herself. Oh, she, she, the Auschwitz has been liberated and uh, she, probably thinks she's going to go home. And instead she's brought to trial and convicted of collaboration with the enemy uh, yes. and, and sentenced to 15 years in a labor camp in Siberia. And so that's Silka's journey. Which, and the second book begins also with her on a train uh, heading to this god awful place. I, I'm somebody who travels a lot, and sometimes I've traveled to very bizarre places, and I have been in northern Russia. I've not been there in the winter, uh, but let me tell you that in the summer, the mosquitoes are the size of hummingbirds, and that's bad enough. It's a very bleak place, and I cannot imagine being there in the winter and in rags and with no shoes. And uh, I mean, I, I didn't go outside my house today because it was snowing and cold. At any rate, you're there telling now the story of this young girl who finds herself in that godforsaken place 
sexually abused again, but I should let you tell it, not me. Well, that was the, that was the reality of being in um, Vorkuta Gulag. By the way, it's 140 kilometers inside the Arctic Circle. So that far north, you know, even my researcher, and I had a professional researcher in Moscow getting me all the information about uh, Borkuta and, uh, and the, during the time that Silka was there. And uh, even she walked it going up to Borkuta, which was a four day train trip from Moscow. That's how far away it is. And there's no road or-, or um, now, yeah. When I said I'd been in Northern Russia, I went by ship, by boat up into the White Sea to Murmansk and the Solovetsky Islands. But anyway, back to, back to her and the place, the, the no, isolated she, bleak she was sentenced to 15 years, as she said. Now she was there for 10. Now, the thing that saved her there without any question was a female doctor from the state of Georgia, not Georgia, US, Georgia in the USSR. And this female doctor who uh, came across Silka, it seems quite early on, within the first 12 months of her being there, offered her a chance of working in the hospital, initially just as a, a clerk, but then she trained her to become a nurse. And because she was now going into a building every day to work, um, for sure that saved her from the, the elements, but it did not save her from the abuse that, that was carried out. Um, when she left the hospital to go back to her block every day and every night. And uh, all the testimonies, all the research, the documents, the photos that I've got just totally confirm that there was no rule of law. You know, it's a little bit in some ways like Birkenau. You know how they used Jewish people to be the kapos and the block leaders and to carry out um, almost some of the punishment on behalf of the Nazis. Well, it in fact was um, senior prisoners uh, who were also given the role of, yeah, absolutely running the camp. There was a handful of Russians there, but they didn't want to be there. And so, yeah, that's where a lot of the abuse actually was uh, perpetrated on the girls and the gulags. It wasn't by the Russians or the Soviets, but by these other, yes, more senior, shall we say, lifers, the people who've been there for a long time. Mm. She survived. And she survived to get a man. Just like Lily and Gita, she met a man who she would then spend the next 50 and, years. And you, you made the man up, Alexander, right? No, I, made, I changed his name. I did oh, not okay. make Okay, yeah. He is, he is not made up. His name has changed. And um, that is all, but not who he is and what you he know, heard. You know, a wonderful thing that comes through in both books and with both characters, Lolly, Gita, and, and uh, Silka, is that despite the terrible abuse uh, and the horrific things they underwent, they, they still had the capacity to love and, and to be loved. And yeah, and Didi, Didi, I just want to quickly respond to Didi. Yes, Silka very much was Jewish. Absolutely, that's why she was in Auschwitz with the Jewish girls taken there in April 42. So um, that just, Back. But you want to talk about the resilience of these young girls and, and young people to survive, uh, particularly, and, and I, I don't want to separate out one particular nation, but when you consider that the Slovakian girls and boys were uh, the very first taken there in March and April 1942, and then left in January 1945. So that longevity of their surviving uh, does speak something to their resilience and mm, mm -hmm. yeah, who they are and what they are. You know, look, Sabaki is sort of almost like my second home. I love the people there. Yeah. Uh, and um, they seem to respect and welcome me back there, which is why I was able to go there and meet the friends and neighbours of Silkas, because I didn't get to meet her, mm. but I did meet them. And they were able to tell me about this amazing woman that they had known for decades. How <laughs> loving. What about the amazing woman who was the doctor, who is such an important character in the book and was an important person in, in uh, Silka's real life? I was very touched by the doctor. Do you know what became of her? Yeah, we do. And do you know um, why she was there? Um, she actually volunteered. She was, uh, you could just imagine that, well, maybe not so much there, but a female doctor uh, back in the 19, late 1940s uh, not too many of them around, I think down in Australia and New Zealand for sure, 
but uh, she had gone there. She'd come from a family of doctors and uh, to her, she wanted to go somewhere where she could make a difference, which is why she almost she did volunteer to go to the, the Gulag. Yeah, her name is Yelena. And uh, I know that she moved from that Gulag to a hospital in Sochi in the Soviet Union. And Silka visited her several times. Silka was able to find her. She could track her down being a doctor mm -hmm. and uh, reconnected with her. And you've got to remember that Slovakia was under communist rule during this time. And still Silka found a way to leave that country and go back to Sochi and, uh, and visit Yelena. Uh, the friends and neighbors said they, to their knowledge, Yelena never came to Slovakia. It was, it was one way, mm -hmm. but uh, through correspondence and Silka visiting, um, yeah, she, she owed her life to Yelena and she stayed in Yelena's life as long as she could. That's a wonderful, wonderful story. Uh, you are seeing apparently questions because you answered a few. I am not seeing any questions. Is there a way? Ari, can you we show? Look, I'm just grabbing some of them that are, that are short. So that's why I've responded to the short. <laughs> I'm not seeing any, any. but at any rate, uh, I, I know there are probably a lot of people wanting to ask questions. I love it. Okay. You guys do still have a little time before, if, if you want to chat further before audience Q&A, but if you click the chat function on the bottom of your screen, the question should pop up. And this is a moment to encourage all of our audience to please feel free to keep submitting questions and comments for the panelists. Okay, and, and while, they, while we wait for them to do that, I do have an, another odd question for you. Yeah. And uh, it's because of something that I have occasionally, unfortunately experienced. I, I, I've done one book which deals tangentially with the Holocaust and I have had, I have been asked from an audience more than once the question, why do we have to keep telling this story? And have you had any of this kind of negative response? Oh, the negative response has been infinitesimal. Yeah, fortunately yeah. it is small. When you uh, consider that 9 million books have been sold of The Tattooist, and I'm told that for every book sold anywhere between another two, three people will have read it, uh, that means that if you've got one or two people who have felt the need to criticize it, well, that's fine. We, I respect that, everyone to their own. But um, yeah, to me, they have to be told because it's almost like a cycle, isn't it? There's always new generations that need to be reminded of particular history. And I think it's probably just timing with me with regard to the story and how well it's done. Mm. But no, I'm, I'm hoping that, because I know in Australia and New Zealand and in the United Kingdom, the Tattooist of Auschwitz is now in the school curriculum. And I'm working with education departments here in Australia in particular to um, provide, I can't go to every school, so I'm providing podcasts and extra uh, videos to show. And um, when I do go to those schools, and I've done, I've done a lot of Zooms into schools, yeah. the response from the young people is nothing but phenomenal. They want to know. They want to know. I'm, I'm, you may know this already, but uh, I will tell you in case you don't, uh, that in Germany, the high, uh, gymnasium students, high school students, toward the end of their gymnasium experience, are all taken to concentration camps. Uh, Germany has a, a commitment to teaching Holocaust studies to their students. My only granddaughter has grown up in Germany, and so uh, I've, I've watched this education process. And as it happens, my husband and I were visiting Dachau couple of years ago. And while we were there, a group of German high school students were brought in. And I could see them as they entered. And they were like every high school kid in Australia or the United States. They were fooling around and poking each other and laughing. And within a very short period of time, uh, their demeanor had changed. They were solemn. They were attentive. Uh, they were moved. And every high school student in Germany goes through that experience, which I think speaks well for the, uh, the German educational system. Oh, couldn't agree more. And um, by the way, I'm just gonna quickly answer a question about Silke, whether she caught up with Josie 
and, and Natia, uh, no, all her attempts to find her, uh, I'm told once again, given the circumstances of uh, where she was living, that she did not connect with them again, only Elena, that she could track her because she was a doctor. But yes, and I, went, I had the absolute honour of being part of the March of the Living in um, April 2018, and I was there in Krakow with those thousands of uh, students from all around the world who gathered there. And, and I even one evening at the Jewish Community Center in Krakow got to speak to you know, a few hundred of the American boys and girls that were there. And it was you know, such an honor to be able to do that. And this was before the book came out, by the way, in the US, so they didn't yeah. know anything. About I, I noticed that one of, I've, I've now figured out how, how to open up the <laughs> box that shows the questions. And I noticed that one of the attendees tells us that in Poland, all of the students visit Auschwitz. Yes, they do. Here's the thing about Poland, it's really um, quite fascinating for me. Uh, I've been absolutely, once again, humbled by the number of books that have been sold in Poland. In fact, I got flown to Poland uh, last year to be given on national live television an award for having the biggest selling book in 2018 in all of Poland. The biggest selling book, a book about the Holocaust. And um, I think from my memory, the publishers told me that in Poland right now, there's something around five, 6,000 people who identify as being Jewish. Mm -hmm. so Compared to how many copies yes. of the book, yeah. half a million copies of the book have been sold there. That doesn't tell me it's the Jewish people that are reading it. It's the people who need to read it, the non-Jewish people in Poland. So, so touched by that. Okay. Let's go to some of these questions. Will the miniseries be about both books? Hey, I can read that. No, no, it won't. <laughs> no, it won't. It's just about the tattooist of Auschwitz. Hey, listen, can I share a secret with you, seeing there's only two or three of you watching? Um, the the, the miniseries is not only about the book. Yes, it is about the book from start to end. However, they have included Old Lally and me in the telling. So some poor actress is going to have to play me. I and about Meryl Streep. <laughs> you think she can do a good Kiwi accent? She's had a go at an Aussie one. She did. <laughs> I've heard her do it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. But, um, that, that's all being debated right now. But um, yes, yeah, so they're, they're going to use he and I, him as this 87, 88, 89 year old, and, and my being with him to just weave the telling of his story. So yeah, but you know, you're not going to tell anybody that anyway, are you? Um, somebody asked me about uh, Silka and any children. No, she was unable to have children. The, the, the biggest, uh, um, well, yeah, her neighbours and friends told me that that was the one really sad note in her life. So she just became what they called the apartment mother to every other child. I met women and men in their 40s and 50s who told me how she was their second mum. That in the afternoons after school, when they were kids, that particularly in winter, if they came home and couldn't get into the apartment building because their parents were still at work, every day Silka was down there and she would gather up all the children in that apartment building and take them into her apartment and give them warm drinks and keep them there because their parents knew exactly which door to go knocking on to find their children. That's, when they that's reminiscent of what you described in the book of her care and concern for the children. And, yeah. and can you describe a little bit about who were those toddlers and babies uh, there at, in the Gulag? Well, they, they were the result, of course, of the abuse that was being perpetrated on the girls and the women there. Um, yes, babies were being born. They had two nurseries at Vorkuta, and Vorkuta was about a medium-sized um, gulag. I think it possibly had up to about 25, 30,000 people there at one point when she was there. But there were babies being born there all the time, and they were allowed to stay with their mothers for two years. So even though they, and by staying with their mother, by the way, I meant um, they mothers could stay with them for about four or five weeks and then the mothers had to go back to work and the children got put into just these rooms I'm not going to call it a nursery but they were just minded during the day and then the mothers could get them back and after two years the children were all taken now it turned out a lot of them just were taken and given forcibly to the locals who lived in the town of Wakuta because there is a town called Wakuta as well 
um, but the majority of them, of course, uh, disappeared and those uh, parents never ever saw them again. Mm. Someone here asks, what other groups of people were sent to the work camp that Silke had to work alongside? Were they Nazi criminals or other groups? Oh, absolutely. In fact, um, I read one point that during the time that uh, Silke was in Volkuta, it got referenced as being uh, the little United Nations, that 32 nationalities of people were there. Uh, they were people, a lot of people, of course, who were intelligent, who were academics, who were educated, anyone who posed a threat to the Soviets as they were um, taking over Poland and Hungary and Czechoslovakia. So anybody, because Silke's own husband, he was an academic. You know, he was a, both a, a, a lawyer and um, a lecturer in law, and that, that was you know, his reason for being there. So... Yes, a lot of the people that were there, they came from all countries in Eastern, Middle Europe, Central Europe, Communist Europe, and they were there. There were some criminals, but the majority of them were um, or people even in Moscow and around the Soviet Union who the, the Soviets considered to be a threat to them. If, we, if one were to go there now, what would we see? Oh, good luck. Um, yeah, as I say, it's a four-day train trip. <laughs> <laughs> well, hypothetically. But no, that coal mine still exists. It's still a working coal mine. Okay. And so there's the town, the small town of Wakuta, that really just now houses the people who work and earn an income uh, digging out the coal. So it's very productive still as a coal mining area. Someone asks, did Silka ever reconnect with Josie and her daughter after the Gulag? No, that's what I said. That was the, the, the one that she couldn't find um, in terms of, yeah, what happened to them. Because uh, they got out of Wakuta to, to Moscow, but from there, no. It, it's not like uh, you know, living in Australia and the US in that time, that, that freedom of not only movement, but of freedom of inquiry outside of your little bubble in your communist controlled country. Well, it just it didn't exist. Any of Silka's extended family survived the Holocaust? No, they did not. Um, in fact, if you look on the databases at Yad Vashem and the United States Holocaust database, any of the databases that record uh, the Holocaust, both survivors and uh, non-survivors. And this is where we had a little bit of a problem when we were telling Silke's story and we found her name and her sisters, by the way, and her father. You know, her mother, we really, there is no record of her mother, but her um, two sisters and her father, we did. And um, in Silke, on all those databases, after her name and date of birth and where she came from and when she went to Auschwitz, every one of those databases had the words murdered in Auschwitz. So as far as the records are concerned, she did not survive. And, but we know we did, she did. And we found proof, by the way, and it was such a wonderful moment for me when I was in Slovakia and I was in the town where Silko had been born, a little town called Sabinov. It wasn't the town she was living in when she was taken. And the bureaucrats there and the government has allowed me to see these amazing documents that really I have no right to. I'm talking about birth, deaths, and marriage details of her family going back generations. And they showed me this big journal that had over 200 years worth of births, all hand recorded. And um, that big journal was placed in front of me in this uh, bureaucrat's office. And there were silkers, and I could see her name and her date of birth, her mum and dad's details, and her grandparents. And um, I pushed the paper down. They tried to cover up the other names on the page. I don't know why. I don't read Slovakian. But I, had trans I always have translators with me, as you can imagine. And I noticed something at the end of her story. And I pushed the paper down. And they never had, no one else had this little, like, addendum added onto it, clearly written at another time and in another pen and in another hand. And so I asked my translator, tell me what that says at the end. We thought we had all we wanted to know. And the notation was that on this particular day in 1958, Cecilia Klein came to this office, bringing with her a document from the government in Bratislava, declaring her to be alive and declaring her to be a citizen of the state of Czechoslovakia. So Silka went back to the town, this tiny little town she was born in, 
1958 for them to note in her birth record, I am alive. Wow, that's a wonderful story. Uh, somebody has asked what you're working on now. Uh, and you have, yes, <laughs> you had secretly told me that you have a new book out in Australia, which we haven't yet seen in the United States. But can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about that one. Then I'll tell you a little bit about the one that's coming. Uh, both these books will be released in the US, um, I think, around about the same time next year. So you're getting a double whammy from me, folks. The first one, which is out now in Australia and the UK and a few other countries, it's actually a non-fiction book and it's called Stories of Hope. And this is a book about well, me in a lot of ways. It is my telling you about the, where I came from and the person in my life as a child growing up in rural New Zealand, namely my great grandfather and the lessons he taught me um, about how to listen and how by listening as a child, I carried that all through my life. And that is not only how I got Lully to tell me his story. I got all these friends and neighbors in Slovakia of Silkers to tell me their story. I worked for 20 years in a hospital in Melbourne in the social work department where every day I met people who were there because some tragedy or trauma had befallen them. Um, and so this is a book called Stories of Hope because the number of people who have written to me from around the world sharing with me something tragic or traumatic in their lives and saying, through Lali, Gita and Silka, you have given me hope to, to go on. I, I cannot tell you of the sheer numbers of the, these amazing stories. So I felt of, well, if you have the courage to share with a stranger at the other end of the world something in your life, then maybe it was time for me to you know, toughen up and tell you a little bit about me and how I got these stories. But also, I now get to tell you about Lully and I. And I share with you some of the incredible, funny, not many sad, but hilarious times I had with this man over a three-year period. I get to tell you how I got Silka's story. I get to tell you how I find listening to elderly and how I think I, well, how I do that. And I'll give you some tips on how to do it. Listening to children. I talk to you about listening to yourself. So it's called Stories of Hope because these stories come to me. And there is now even a website called Your Stories of Hope. It's a, my website. And on there, we invite people to write a story of hope and submit it. It goes to the publishers in London. I, I see them too. And we offer to people writing that story, do you want some editorial assistant to write this and so that you may want to enter it into a short story competition? What is the reason you're writing? Would you like us to publish it on the website? Would you like us to just note that somebody else has read your story that, and you writing it, it has helped you just to write it. So that's what Stories of Hope is all about. And I'm so, so proud of, well, the website. Would you just repeat the the website how people can get to that place yeah. well, um, Ari put it up I can see that thank you it is just yourstoriesofhope.com okay and there you can read some, some of these amazing stories but in the back of that book there's at the very end of it I've written a little three-page story about my next book this is my teaser I need <laughs> to tell you about what is also coming out in October next year uh, once I get back onto my computer and, and finish writing it. But um, how in June last year, I was in South Africa in a little place called Franschhoek out of Cape Town. It's a wine region of South Africa, by the way, folks, if anyone of you are into wine and you like good wine. And one night I got back to my hotel room and I read an email from a man, a man who lives in Toronto in Canada. And he wrote to me telling me that he was visiting his mom in Tel Aviv, picked up the book, my book, in Canada. Now Canada has the same cover as Australia, not the American cover. Out of 55 countries who have published the book, only Canada and Brazil have got the same cover as the Australia. It's just two arms on against a black background with the tattooed numbers on it. He picked that up at Toronto Airport, took it to Tel Aviv and the next day went out to read it and left it on his mother's coffee table. His mother walked past, looked down at the cover and said the words, that must be about Lali and Gita. 
She looked at the number that's on the arm of the girl on the cover. And then she looked at the number on her own arm, three apart. And she knew that her sister Sibby's was two apart. She remembered Lully tattooing her and her sister. Mm -hmm. And these three girls, 15, 17, and 19, three sisters. That's why, well, that's the name of the book, by the way. Three, three sisters. sisters. Okay. Three sisters came from the same town as Gita, went to school with her, were on that train, two of them in April 42 to Auschwitz. The middle sister Magda, for other circumstances, she ended up in um, Auschwitz two years later. Their story in Auschwitz is like all Holocaust stories unique because it is theirs. And that's only part of their story. These, these two sisters found the third there. They reunited in Birkenau. They were on a death march like all those other girls in January 45. And they made a decision they would run along with several other girls. Better to be shot in the back than spend another day with the Nazis. The next four weeks, as those young girls travel through Poland and Germany, and you know what it's like in, in that kind of part of the world in, in January, bitterly, bitterly cold. Their death march, survival and escape, is it, well, it's a book in itself, but it, it won't be. Yeah, not only are the Germans now a threat to them, but the Russians. And um, they, they did, they got to the Allies and they, they got back to Slovakia, but that's not where it ends. The third part to their story, they're now rejected again in their hometown, their home country. So what do they do? They got together with several other young Holocaust survivors and they went out into the forest in the Czech Republic. And for three months, they trained to survive there. They trained to become freedom fighters. They trained to not only survive, but how to shoot a gun. And with a gun in each of their pockets, they then traveled, smuggled through the length of Slovakia. I know it's not that big, but you know, they had to still get through it. Then through Romania, also under communist control, to the Black Sea and boarded a boat. And they stepped off that boat in Haifa in Israel at that point in history when rightly or wrongly, and I make no judgment, the United Nations was taking that patch of desert away from the Palestinians and creating the state of Israel. These three young girls are now these pivotal young people at their very beginning, the birth of Israel. Two of them, worked for the very first president of Israel, President Wiseman. His wife came to one of their weddings. And so you will now hear about the, the creation of Israel in those early days, not from the military and the United Nations and the politicians, but just three young girls. Who are three, now just young girls. three sisters is the name three of the book. And that two of them, I can tell you two of them are still alive. So they're 94 and they're 96 years of age. And um, Livia and Magda, uh, I have been to Israel twice now to see them, because when I got that email when I was in South Africa, I sent it to my publishers in London, and we emailed, and by the time I got to Cape Town, I'd rung and spoken to this 93-year-old lady who said to me, I want to see you, you must come. And um, by the time I then got a couple of days later to Johannesburg, and my publisher in London rang me up and said, yes, I agree, you, you must go to Israel and meet these families. And I went, okay, well, I'm going home to Melbourne tomorrow. I'll arrange to go there. And she said, no, no, we're rerouting you from Johannesburg to Tel Aviv. You're going tomorrow morning. Now, I remember saying to Kate, but Kate, I can't go. And she said, why not? I said, because I've run out of clean knickers. You know, I timed it. <laughs> I was probably told to go and buy some new, uh, more knickers or learn how to wash. But um, yeah, 24 hours later, I stepped off a plane in Tel Aviv and... I was going to ask you how your life has changed in these recent years, uh, but I think you've just described that. Uh, Dramatically. <laughs> your life is very different from what it was before the day that you met Lolly. And the three sisters will be out in October next year. That's for Sherry, who just wrote. And so it's finished. You've completed oh, it. I know. No, 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 far from it. Oh, oh, okay. I was going to say, are you working on something beyond that? But you're still working on that. 
I'm still working on it and uh, with the editors in London and in New York. Um, yeah, we're going to tell you one heck of a yarn here, folks. And uh, look, it, it is so uplifting to, to, to know these, well, these three families, the two sisters that I, that of course I might, but their families are now part of their lives as well. Um, yeah, one of them, Livia, who's, who's the 94-year-old who speaks English, I can talk to her. I love it. Here's this 94-year-old in Tel Aviv. I get a message, she wants to talk to me, and she gets on her daughter's you know, mobile or cell phone, and we do WhatsApp video <laughs> yeah, in Tel Aviv, and yeah, she'll chat away for an hour or two with me quite happily. But um, all their family, their adult children and their adult grandchildren, um, I'm all involved in their lives. I've spent many, many days with them, and they're all contributing to telling this amazing story. Well, let me say, because our time is ending, that I'm so glad you've become involved in our lives and let us enter yours for, for this hour and through your books. Thank you. Uh, look, my pleasure. And um, I know you're going to throw back to Ari. Ari, if there's some way that I can access some of those questions and answer them, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do that and I'll write answers back to them if we can find a way for me to continue to see them. Is the tattoo still with the two arms accurate? Absolutely it is. It is the numbers of Lali and Gita. I'm putting right now my email address in the chat and um, anyone who's watching tonight who has follow-up questions, please feel free to shoot me an email and we'll make sure that they get to Heather or Lois afterwards. Uh, thank you again so much for your time and I'm sorry to cut the conversation uh, short, but this was a, an insightful hour to understand the origin of the story and to understand Silka as a character and, and also to get a little teaser and all the exciting things you're working on, Heather. So uh, it was a pleasure for all of us to hear from you both. And to those of you watching, thank you for joining us. Um, in addition to my email, which is in the chat, you'll find a link to purchase Silka's Journey with, uh, at the museum's online shop, as well as a link to support the museum's work. Uh, we are grateful for all the ways that you're involved and make our work as New York's Holocaust Museum possible. Happy last night of Hanukkah to everyone and, and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year's for whatever everybody celebrates. Uh, take care and have a good evening. Stay warm, stay, stay well. Thank you. Yeah.